Good morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Pastor Jim, and I thank you for joining us in worship, either online or here in person or by video afterwards. Um, we are glad that you are joining us today. Um, we, um, I wanted to mention one quick announcement. There are mid-year statements in the back of the church, right? Okay. Please pick those up after worship. Um, and I don't know if they're alphabetized or if they're, are they? Okay. She's so efficient. So please pick up your mid-year giving statements. I know it's the end of July, and this is through the end of J June, the statements are. Um, but please pick those up um, for your stewardship. Uh, also, um, today we are finishing up the Great Commission. Um, this is part two of sharing the gospel. And if I say to you to boldly share where we have not shared before, that may sound like an old Star Trek episode, but it reminds us of what the Great Commission tells us to do and be in the world, to boldly share the gift of Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about what that means and how we can do that, some tools to use, and um, how to go about that in our daily lives. Um, and I don't think I have any other announcements. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. <laughs> Good morning. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 107, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And from verse 9, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Please join me in singing our opening hymn, as we stand together, if we can, we all are one in mission.
be seated. God greets us and we greet each other with a responsive reading. Peace I leave with you, said Jesus. Let us now share this extravagant gift with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. In our wanderings and selfish desires, we have forsaken fellowship with our families, our friends, and our neighbors. We have neglected to share the gospel of Christ in those opportunities. If we openly confess these weaknesses to God, he promises to hear us and respond with forgiveness and mercy. Let's join together in confessing to God and before each other. Merciful God, we live in a society that focuses on gathering things. We collect, store, gather items, gadgets, even people. We focus our energies on our collections, providing adequate room for them, and yet we bar the door to the needs of others. For those who need to hear the gospel message and promise of Jesus Christ, we are sorry for the ways in which we have failed you. Forgive us. Turn us around to look at the ways in which our wealth, both of substance and spirit, can be used for healing and hope. Enable us to be in ministry to those in need and to care for this world. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Children of God, blessings have been poured upon you so that you may use them to help others. God walks with you and guides your steps as you reach out in compassion, mercy, and justice to all in need. Know this and be at peace in your forgiveness. children out there can benefit from this. Can you all see that? All of you, all of you, and all of you. Maybe I should turn this a little bit. Okay, so we're talking about sharing the gospel, right? And today, boldly sharing the gospel right? The gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a simple way for kids and for adults and everybody in between to share the gospel with a simple three-circle design. Have any of you seen this before? No? There's, a, there's several of these out there. Um, simple ways to use an object or use a diagram or use a picture to tell the gospel of Jesus Christ in three minutes or less. Okay? Don't look at your watch. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so this is what it is, right? We live in a broken world. I know that's a pretty poor circle, but that's my ability. We live in a world of brokenness, right? The world is broken in many, many ways, right? There are cracks in it. And you can probably name some of those cracks, right? Sickness, illness, conflict, war, killing, racial injustice, just to name a few. The world is broken. I think everybody would agree to that, correct? All right, so 
That's not the world that God created, right? God created a perfect world, right? You remember the story from Genesis 1, where he created everything, right? And it was perfect. There were no flaws. There were no conflict, no war, no no illness, no death. But something happened, right? Something happened between here and here. And it's called sin. Now, I don't know if you can read that. That's pretty close to the top, Pastor Jim. And your S looks pretty sad. Sin is what breaks the world, has broken the world. And it's in every one of us. Okay? So we're flawed. Well, God in his perfect plan created a solution. And you all can probably tell me what the solution is, right? Jesus is the solution. The fact that he died on the cross covers the brokenness, covers the sin, forgives the sin, overcomes death, all of those things, right? And because God loves us so much, whoa, (laughs) it's a pretty sad heart too. Um, he, he gave this gift to us as a way of covering our brokenness and recovering from our brokenness, all right? So Jesus, Jesus came down to earth to cover our brokenness, to live as one of us and, and die on the cross for our sins. Okay? Now, it's not over. Our responsibility is not over because we can, we can recover God's perfectness by believing in Jesus Christ if we get on our knees, and I'm not even going to try to draw a person on their knees, but you're supposed to do that, um, and pray and ask for forgiveness and repent if we turn away from and believe, wow, from here, if we turn away from here and believe in Jesus, we are forgiven. So again, our responsibility doesn't end there. We're supposed to go into the world and share that with everybody. Share that message with everybody. Share the fact that they have an answer to their brokenness, right? And and it's just believing and repenting, repenting and believing in Jesus Christ and what he did for us, all of us. And so go into the world is what the Great Commission tells us. Go and, and, and baptize everyone, all nations, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is what allows this to happen, right? The Holy Spirit is a part of all of this. God sent his Holy Spirit to help us do that. That's the gospel message in an easy three-circle design. So how many of you think you could do that now? Oh, yes, you could. (laughs) Stop shaking your head no. Try it sometime. Get out a piece of paper and draw three circles and then just tell the story. That's all it requires. So whether you show that to a friend or whether you just want to remind yourself of the message, it's a good way of visualizing the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Let's have a prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you that it is as simple as three circles. It is as simple as your grand plan for all of humanity. Help us to share that message wherever we are, wherever we go, and however we want to do it, however we feel comfortable. Help us to do that. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
I have a habit of going off script a little bit, but I just want to tell you some of my earliest memories of getting um, to know Jesus Christ. When I was a little girl, my aunt and her good friend had a club for the kids in the neighborhood, and it was called the Good News Club. And there we received, um, we, we learned about Jesus Christ, and also we got great cookies. So that's a very fond memory of when I was a little girl. Um, now let us uh, bow our heads and pray for illumination. Loving Lord, open our hearts this day as we proclaim your holy word, as we offer praise and thanksgiving in response to your abundant acts of love, challenge us to seek the values of heaven over the trappings of this world. May our words we experience this day call us to a rich relationship with you as we learn to live out the calling of our baptism and the great commission of Jesus Christ. Amen. And appropriately, our sermon hymn today <clears throat> is I Love to Tell the Story. Please stand. <clears throat> Testament lesson comes from Psalm 32, verses 1 to 5. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who record the Lord, or excuse me, whose rec record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Night and day, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. The Great Commission that we have been discussing was given to us and to Jesus' apostles by Jesus himself. Those, these were his words. 
And as I've said at the beginning, it's found in all four Gospels. They aren't the same words in all four Gospels, but Matthew 28, 18 to 20 are the words that we focused on because it's the most complete and maybe the easiest to understand what he's saying. But it's also in Luke 24, verse 47. It's also in Mark 16, 15 to 18. And in John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 21 to 23. We've discussed what it means that Jesus has commanded us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to teach them all that I have commanded you, and I will be with you even to the end of the age. We've defined a disciple as a true follower of Jesus Christ and concluded that to make disciples, we must live as disciples. And so... To be a true follower of Jesus Christ, there are certain characteristics of that in how we live, how we speak, how we respond, how we are in the world. And last week we learned that sharing the gospel message is an important characteristic or responsibility of a follower of Christ. Do you remember the acronym for gospel that I gave last week? G-O-S-P-E-L, God, our sin, paid the price, Jesus, through Jesus, for everyone, and gave us eternal life and life now. Last week we read from Luke's gospel about Philip boldly sharing the gospel, the good news. And although he was an Ethiopian official and probably had an experience that none of us will ever have exactly. There were lessons that we talked about that we can learn from Philip being so bold in sharing the gospel. All of the circumstances surrounding that event and this, the baptism of this person were unusual, were unique, and they were bold to say the least. But there is a common characteristic in that situation and in our lives and our responsibility to be bold in sharing the gospel. And it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us, strengthens us, prepares us to share the gospel, just like God did for Philip. So, we know that God is constantly doing a new thing in you and in me and in those around us. And just as the Apostle Paul explains, this new thing is that he wants us to share that gospel with others. Let's read this explanation together in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 21. This is the New Living Translation, so it's different than the Pew Bibles. But hear God's word, starting with verse 16. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. May God bless our hearing of his word this day. Would you please pray with me? Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Sharing the gospel. 
Does that intimidate anybody in the room? Sharing the gospel as a responsibility of every Christ follower? No intimidation here? That's excellent. <laughs> Maybe I should sit down. No. Um, it's okay to be intimidated by this responsibility, if you are, or fearful even of this responsibility, as long as it does not prevent us from carrying that out in whatever way. You can hesitate, but you need to carry that out. You need to follow through. We do, with God's help. Do not allow any fear or lack of confidence or intimidation to cause you to hesitate forever in learning how to share boldly in your life. Would you say that you are bold in your faith or bold in your Christian living or bold in sharing it with others? Yes, no, maybe, sometimes. <clears throat> maybe we should begin with what it means to live as a bold Christian in the 21st century or to be bold in our faith. I sometimes like acronyms because they can help me to remember important things. And although our world is full of acronyms and they are overused at times, they can still be helpful sometimes. <clears throat> Last week, as we learned about sharing the gospel, I gave us an acronym for gospel. Today, we are going to see that a disciple of Jesus shares that gospel boldly. And this is part two of the message of sharing as a way of living out the Great Commission. So here it is. Bold is spelled B-O-L-D, right? Be consistent in prayer. Offer to tell your spiritual story. Let your light shine before all people. And don't be weird, just be yourself. You like that last one. You like that last one. Don't be weird, just be yourself. Be bold in sharing the gospel message. How many of you are familiar with Penn and Teller? Oh, almost everybody. Wow. The professional magicians and comedians that started in Las Vegas, but now they've expanded. They're on television and um, lots, of area, lots of media. I discovered a video clip of Penn Gillette being given a Bible after a show. And I'm going to play it for you in a few moments here, but Penn Gillette is not only one part of the magician duo Penn and Teller, he's an author, he's a thinker, he's an inventor, and he's an outspoken atheist. A few years ago, after a show, a man walked up to him and handed him a Bible. That night, that very night, Penn made this video clip talking about that experience. And so I want you to watch this. Did you hear him? How much do you have to hate someone to not share the gospel? That came from a professing atheist who has no respect for any Christian who does not share what he or she faithfully believes. He said that. Uh, when they answer, say right? a few words about it. There are many available kinds of tools that we all can use to share the gospel boldly. Handing somebody a Bible is just one of them. I would like to mention a few of these this morning, but let's first review some reasons for not sharing the gospel as given by many Christians. In 1979, the Jesus Film Project began as a simple film to explain and teach about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, right? 1979, that began. As an organization that developed into translating that film into hundreds and hundreds of languages across the world, the ministry of the Jesus Project film organized in 1985 and still continues today. 
They have researched and surveyed Christians and non-Christians by asking people what kept them from sharing the gospel with others. Here are the most common answers. Fear of rejection, fear of hostility, lack of opportunities, too busy, too shy, didn't feel equipped. This morning, I hope to help you feel more equipped to share your faith in any way. When you feel more equipped, you will be more confident and less fearful in lots of ways. In other words, you will become bold in sharing the gospel message of your faith. By the time our New Testament passage in 2 Corinthians was written, the city of Corinth was a mess. It just was. In fact, the church that the Apostle Paul had started in Corinth was also a mess. There were groups fighting with each other. (coughs) Excuse me. Sexual immorality running rampant. A general lack of care for others. Misuse of the Lord's Supper. And false teachers that were leading people astray, just to name a few things. Paul wrote two letters to this church to rebuke them, to challenge them, to encourage them, and to redirect them and help them become healthy again. At the end of chapter 5, which we read from, Paul takes on their lack of love for other people, particularly their lack of sharing the gospel and sharing it boldly with the lost. Right at the beginning of our passage today, We see that Paul's understanding of God's amazing grace (coughs) has changed the way he views other people dramatically. Look at verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. You see, the moment... From the moment of salvation on the Damascus Road, Paul started seeing people with different eyes. He started to see everyone with different eyes. That's a tool we can use also. God's Holy Spirit can help us see people differently. I have always, for a long time, enjoyed Matthew West's song, Give Me Your Eyes for many years. Um, The chorus goes something like this, and I'm not going to sing it. Thank God, Pastor Jim. (laughs) Give me your eyes for just one second. Give me your eyes so I can see everything that I keep missing. Give me your love for humanity. Give me your arms for the brokenhearted, the ones that are far beyond my reach. Give me your heart for the ones forgotten. Give me your eyes so I can see. The Apostle Paul no longer viewed people from a worldly point of view. Are you looking at people from a worldly perspective every day? It's hard not to. It's difficult. Can't do it yourself. Can't change that yourself. Ask God to give you his eyes and his perspective. Perhaps then you will be motivated to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in more of a bold way than before. Once you have God's perspective, your heart will have already begun to change. There's no person that you have met. Listen to this carefully. There is no person that you have met or that you have not met yet that God does not consider infinitely valuable and loved. Whether it's Nancy Pelosi, President Biden, the guy down the street that flies the white power flag, or Bruce Caitlyn Jenner. All of those people are loved by God. They are not the enemy. They are the mission field. Pray for all of them and any others that you want to look at differently. So then Paul continues by saying to us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this new creation has come. The old has gone. The new has begun. I like this posting on Facebook by the skit guys. Has anybody heard of the skit guys? Some of you. 
They posted, one day Paul was killing Christians, the next day he was a Christian. Peter was a fisherman, and the next day he was a fisher of men. Don't judge someone based on that one day. If God can create the whole world in six days, he can surely create a new heart in one. God doesn't care about outside appearances. He focuses on the heart. We've said that many times. Then, God, then Paul writes about our main objective in sharing the gospel boldly. Reconciliation with God himself through Jesus Christ. That's the goal for everybody. God doesn't want to make people better. He wants to make them new. Becoming a Christian isn't like joining a club. So don't spread that message. The gospel you and I are called to share is telling people it's more like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Reconciliation here means to exchange as in coins, to change from enemy to friend. Out of all the world religions, only one God, only our God, is a reconciling God. He's the only one. God did not need to be reconciled to us. We needed to be reconciled to him. And every person you and I share this truth boldly with needs it as much as we do. We are all powerless to do this on our own, all of us. None of us are trained to do this. We can't be good enough or jump high enough or make these changes enough for his holiness. That is the story to tell anyone and everyone. So we need Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And the story is just another tool to use to be bold in sharing this gospel. Tell the story, as we sang earlier. Paul then explains why we are ambassadors for Christ, the story of the cross and what it has done for him and for us. So friends, in this dark and dying world, we get to be Christ's ambassadors. It's a privilege. It's a gift. We get to represent the King of Kings to anyone and everyone. We are the channel through which God makes his appeal to the lost world. We're his hands and feet. You can say that in lots of different ways. And that person or persons that you boldly share the gospel with needs to be implored to be reconciled to Christ. They need it desperately. How do we do that? Well, we've already mentioned a few tools to use. The Holy Spirit, the story of your own faith, and the story of the cross of Jesus. But here is maybe more, two more effective tools. Using our words and using our lives to share the gospel. Friends, you and I are writing a gospel each day. You are. We are. Here's a short poem called, You Are Writing a Gospel. A chapter each day by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. People read what you and I write, distorted or true. What is the gospel according to you? There are many other ways to share the gospel boldly. Some of these have simple props or objects to use, like the three circles. Others have simple words to speak or sing. And I want to close by reading a true story of how a little girl shared the gospel with her father in a meaningful way. There was a family with one little daughter. Mother and daughter were very faithful in church and Sunday school attendance. They went every week. The father, however, wasn't interested, and he made it plain that it was okay for his wife and daughter, but not for him. He had better things to do on Sunday. He worked in a steel mill. He was a huge hulk of a man who had been a football player at Ohio University. The daughter, Susie, became ill and was taken for diagnosis to the family doctor. She had leukemia. And as it was an advanced stage, it was too late to save her eventually. The family was to take her home, care for her as comfortably as possible. 
before she passed away. Each night on coming home from work, this man, this father, stopped at Susie's bedroom. That was his first stop. He would visit and spend some time with her, and daily her condition worsened little by little, and she lost weight, her cheeks were sunken, her color looked very bad. And one night in particular, Susie had obviously been doing some serious thinking. And because she asked her father, Daddy, I know I will die soon and go to be with Jesus. My Sunday school teacher taught me that. But Daddy, when I get to heaven, I will be given a crown to wear. And my crown will have no stars in it because I've not led anybody to know Jesus Christ yet. So Daddy, will you give your life to Jesus so I can have a star in my crown? The father, through his tears, nodded his head and right there prayed a prayer of commitment, a sinner's prayer of commitment to Jesus Christ. It made Susie's eyes light up with joy. She called for her mother and told her what daddy had just done, and a few days later, she passed away. On the next Sunday morning came Susie's daddy with her mother walking together into church. Time was taken for a testimony in the service, and this man stood and said, may I say a few words? The preacher assured him, yeah, go ahead. The man went on, I was resistant to the gospel, and I had rejected pastors, evangelists, my own family that tried to lead me. I could reject anyone except for my daughter. He paused to wipe the tears away and went on. Because she asked me and because she loved me, I gave my life to Jesus. She reached me when no one else could. Then just before he sat down, he looked upward and finished with this. And now Susie is in heaven wearing a crown promised to her and a single star in her crown. That's me. So who is it you're afraid to tell the gospel, to share the gospel with? Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Is it a sibling? Is it a stranger? Don't let anything prevent you from sharing the gospel good news as boldly as you possibly can. Amen. In our prayer time, <clears throat> we want to pray for any of those people, any of those places, those circumstances that are on our hearts and minds in this moment, knowing and believing that God will hear us and answer us in his way and in his time. So what is on your heart and mind today to give to God? Shelley. Thank you, Shelley. We'll keep Susie's family in our prayers. Anyone else? Karen. S-O-N-D-E-J. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Linda. 
Use and your microphone, please. I want to ask for prayers for all of those who were affected by the floods, losing their homes, their families, uh, their their lives. It's it's tragic, and I, I my heart goes out to the many people that suffered from that. There was, a, um, there was a mission trip sponsored by Old Union. Just recently, they returned from helping rebuild homes um, because of that the damage. And um, it involved seven different churches or eight different churches and like 36 people. Um, we were told about it at the presbytery meeting But yes, there's an ongoing work. There's another mission trip coming up to go back down there um, to help further rebuild some homes and buildings and lives. Anyone else? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God of our lives, you have promised to hear us and to answer us in your way and in your time. And today we lift up um, our prayers to you, both joys and concerns, the people, the places, the circumstances on our hearts and minds um, you can take care of, you can heal, you can strengthen, and you can be with. So be with those across the world in worship this day, those in dangerous places, whether it be on the street or in homes or in church buildings. Strengthen them with your Holy Spirit. Help them to continue to glorify you in whatever ways they can and, and to preach the gospel good news of Jesus Christ in whatever ways they can. Help them to be bold in their faith and in sharing that faith, not only today, but seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Lord God, help us to do the same and be with those who are suffering or are afflicted with illness or recovering from surgery or dealing with health challenges. Heal them, strengthen them, give them your peace and reassurance that you are the great physician and that you, will, you are taking them by the hand and walking with them through their challenge. Lord God, we lift up Susie's family and ask your blessing upon them. Give them your peace. Give them your Holy Spirit in the coming days and weeks as they preserve her memory and as they celebrate her life. Lord God, we are thankful for Karen's recovery and for the specialists that have treated her. May you continue to be involved in that treatment and may you continue to help Karen to share the good news of the gospel as she has for so long. Strengthen her, heal her, and give her your uh, loving care. We pray for her grandson-in-law's family and ask your blessing upon them um, as they deal with this loss. Help them to recover, help them to know that you are in their lives and their loved one is with you face to face. Lord God, um, we lift up those who have lost their homes in natural disasters and lost their lives, their livelihood, their friends, their family members, be in that place or in those places. Strengthen them. Work through the workers that are on the ground and uh, strengthen them for the rebuilding and for the reconstruction and for the sharing of the gospel. God loves them and help them to show that love. Lord God, we thank you for your presence here with us today. We thank you for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ 
Help us to be his hands and feet in this world so that all may come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. For we ask and we pray all of these things in his strong name, who taught us to pray using these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Prosperity, in a lot of ways, is given to the greater community of believers so that all of God's children may benefit with the idea that believers will share what they've been given. Let us demonstrate that we are the body of Christ through our extravagant sharing of God's blessings this day. And let us give out of joy rather than out of a sense of obligation as we offer our gifts to God and the gifts of our hearts to God. Help me as I dedicate all of our giving to God's work in this world. Please pray with me. Gracious God of our lives, we bring our gifts to you this day and in the coming days. As we give, transform our hearts so that they are open to your voice and your direction and your plans for our lives of sharing the gospel. Giving is a way of sharing the gospel good news. And as we give, bless the gifts and the giver and the receiver, that they would all welcome Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and that all would be strengthened. Your work would be strengthened in this world. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Please join me now in standing, if you're able, and singing, We Are Called to Be God's People. nowhere by accident where you go where you are where you find yourself God has placed you there for a purpose and Jesus Christ living inside of you will walk with you strengthen you and prepare you for that purpose so go with the love of God the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the fellowship guidance and strength of the Holy Spirit today and every day amen <clears throat>